and the friends, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome my panelists and speaker, dear respected speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Hassan Aldibi, uh, Dr. Vishali Gupta, Dr. Avinash, and Dr. Uh, Ahmed from United States. He will join us within a few minutes. Uh, today, I would like to thank our speaker for accepting our invitation and to be with us. Uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, thanks Alimera for sponsoring this meeting. And on behalf of uh, Middle East Ophthalmology uh, Meeting, Posterior Segment Symposium, and uh, uh, on behalf of uh, Al Qasimi Ophthalmology International Conference, uh, and on behalf of Anterior Segment uh, Northern Emirate Dubai Group, and also on behalf of uh, Posterior Segment. Uh, Northern Emirate Dubai Retina Group, I would like to welcome all of you. And uh, we will start uh, with my dear friend, Dr. Uh, Hassan Al-Dibi uh, on his uh, cases. And we can have uh, a question from dear uh, colleagues or those they are following us. Uh, they can raise hand. And if someone who cannot uh, uh, see that we are responding, he can send a WhatsApp to the number that uh, is showing in the invitation. Uh, or to my WhatsApp, I can check that if there is, because some of my dear friends, they are telling, we are raising hand and uh, we are not allowed to say, but sometimes we are not seeing their raising hand. Uh, and also you can send the questions to the uh, uh, to uh, question and answer. So we can also pick up, but please uh, put the name of the doctors that you want to his uh, a comment or answer your questions. Uh, Dr. Hassan uh, Adib is a senior academic consultant uh, veterinary and Uveitis Chief Uveitis Division in Kekish. He is a clinical assistant professor at King Saudi uh, Saud University, Riyadh. Uh, and uh, I would like to welcome my dear friend, Dr. Hassan. Please, you can have the mic with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad. First of all, it's a great pleasure to be with you and participating in this uh, webinar, which is Middle East uh, Ophthalmology Meeting uh, organized by you, Dr. Muhammad, and uh, Alimera, and thanking as well, thanking as well the uh, Al-Qasimi Hospital for giving this opportunity to be together. Uh, to, tonight, we are going to discuss uh, uh, Uveatis cases that have a couple of message and home messages. So I will start with the first case that is uh, 41 year old, African origin females, referred with right eye ptosis, uh, fifth, seventh, and eighth cranial nerve palsy, to rule out sarcoidosis or Wagner gargamotosis. This is, was on uh, September 2015. Her ocular examinations, visual acuity in the right eye was hand motion and left eye 2200, and the pressure was within normal limit. Slit lamp examination of both eyes were within normal, and here fundus show these pictures. So if you look for the pictures here, you, you find that the right eye is having really uh, uh, optic nerve enlarged cubbing with pale disc in the same time left eye, almost same with a uh, little bit increase in the cup disc ratio. Uh, so Dr. this patient, Hassan, yeah, this can patient. I stop you here? I want uh, any comment from Dr. Bishali and or Dr. Avi. What do you think if just this is the, the case and this the patient came to you and he show you saw this uh, fundus? What is your comment before Dr. Hassan going on? I think the usual uveitis generally doesn't present with proptosis. The proptosis and the cranial nerve involvement means there is something happening, you know, up there in the brain or something in the orbit. Now, before Dr. Hassan goes on, I think looking at the ethnicity of the patient, sarcoidosis will be very high on cards for me. Uh, Dr. Abi, do you have any other comments? No, I agree that, uh, you know, the, uh, with the proptosis is not the usual feature of uveitis. Uh, also, uh, you know, you can see that the disc looks a bit more cupped and pale, so perhaps this has been going on for some time and would explain uh, the vision being reduced. Okay, let us see what Dr. Hassan done and we we'll yeah. see how... So the patient, this patient yeah. initially uh, seen with the uh, echoloblasty divisions and they uh, 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 did for her uh, MRI and showed normal uh, uh, findings. 
and actually even though they uh, 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 make a, a biopsy from her lacrimal gland and show just only non-specific inflammatory cell and cannot rule uh, uh, glomerulitis uh, of sarcoidosis. So what's happened after that, the patient came with uh, a sudden blurry and decreased vision associated with ocular pain in her good left eye for four weeks. And the examination. Hassan, what you have done, I mean, uh, in the first the beginning when the patient came. Uh, yeah, the, so patient, the, the patient referred to uh, echoblasty actually in the beginning. Okay. So uh, uh, MRI of the brain and orbit done and showed no abnormalities. And biopsy of the lacrimal gland of the left eye showed non-specific inflammatory cells and not confirmed okay. Present of the of the of the of the sargaitosis. So Sorry. the patient. Yes, please. Doctor Abi. Yes, Doctor Abi Sharias. Go, Go ahead. ahead. So. I'm... So Did what's you... happened? Can you ask the question again, Doctor Bishali? Because you are mute. Yes. Did it respond to corticosteroids that episode? Yeah, that time no, nothing is given. The patient had been treated in a referral area with immunosuppressive medications, uh, putting in their mind this is sarcoidosis case because of the multiple cranial nerve palsy with proptosis. Uh, and when we did the biopsy, it's really not uh, really confirmed the presence of sarcoidosis. Uh, what's happened now to the other eyes? The patient presented with sudden blurry and decreased fusion associated with ocular pain for her left eye. And fusion dropped to 2080 now. So it is not same as one month ago. So what's happened, this is her pictures. If you look for the light, the right eye, you see that there is a synechia. Synechia. And, and no active cells in the anterior chamber. Left eye showed occasional cells with normal intracranial pressure and fusion 2080. And up on examination of the fundus, we see these pictures. If you look temporal to the macula, there is a, a, a mass or infiltrate just only uh, around one disc diameters with little bit satellite lesions with subretinal fluid surrounding that area. So this is where now dealing with the good eye. So uh, okay. in this case- Doctor, any comments? Yeah, we need a comment. There is another also, I think not only this finding, there is another findings in the, according to the picture, right? This is an anterior- Dr. Bichali, no, posterior. I Can would you, like to see Andrew. What, uh, okay, so what is the next? Angiogram and OCT. Yeah, this is this is the OCT. Uh, this is the angiogram, Angio. uh, air, early one. And you look here carefully, you find that temporal to the macula, there is faint area of hypofluorescent with advancing of the frames, six uh, seconds. We see that there is starting to have faint hyperfluorescent corresponding to area of that whitening, uh, uh, yellow whitening uh, uh, infiltrate. With increasing, we see that increase and the margin a bit fuzzy. Then starting to uh, having a staining and leakage. And here now the disc is starting to be a little bit hot. So did it look like oxo to you clinically, Dr. Hassan? So what's that? So it's, it's a focal lesion. The rest of the vasculature is not affected. Yeah. Yes. No, 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 no fas associated vasculitis in this case. So our uh, 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 primitive diagnosis here, it's mostly to have to rule out uh, possibility of choroidal granuloma versus uh, uh, metastasis or masquerade syndrome. This is the beginning of the case. In addition to that, we did for her the usual workup for uveitis, including the CBC, differential, electrolytes, liver function, uh, 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 TBHA and RBR to roll uh, serology for syphilis. And we did BBD and quantiferon. CT scan of the chest was the lungs within normal, but we noticed in the press there is uh, calcified uh, nodule. Examinations of the rest of the nodules of the I mean, lymph nodes in the body uh, didn't show any uh, uh, enlargement or prominent. Uh, we did ACE and lysozymes. Uh, we did ANCA and hepatitis screening and turned to be within normal. And MRI, as uh, mentioned before, was within normal. So what we did in this case, again, this is the, the situations. 
BBD was positive in these patients. And accordingly, we stopped her previous immunosuppressive medication and steroid. We start her in uh, full anti-tuberculosis medications for uh, three days. Then we couple it with uh, uh, oral steroids, one milligram per kg. And we expected that to move. This is her OCT. And you see that there is uh, a mass pushing the retina from the choroids. And after that, we're thinking this is most likely is uh, 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 tuberculosis rather than to be. The patient seen as well by the oncologist to make sure that we don't miss the case. And up on to, bit for, to do for her bit scan, but actually after their examination, they said there is no foci of uh, 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 tumors. So we continue our treatment. So Dr. what do you expect? Dr. Uh, uh, Hassan, uh, how do you confirm it is a TB? I will, I will, I'm coming in the way, yani. because oh, okay. based on the PBD, and we have really uh, uh, choroidal uh, uh, mass, most likely is uh, granuloma-like, is not more. So we continue with our treatment. But uh, to rule out the possibility of metastasis, we did our part. We did MRI, we did ultrasound of the abdomen, we did CT scan of the chest, and we sent the patient to the oncologist. They work here and they couldn't find foci for tumors. Sarcoidosis already been ruled out by biopsy in the same times. And the chest uh, CT scan didn't show the typical picture of sarcoidosis. I don't know what uh, Dr. Fishali could help in this. You know, the points in favor of tuberculosis will be chronicity of the disease. If we look at the right eye, there are broad-based posterior synechae. If we look at the left eye, there is a choroidal granuloma. Sarcoid normally doesn't produce granulomas in the choroid. And if we look within the center of the granuloma, there is a small little hemorrhage also. I don't know. I thought there were some vessels dipping in. So if we see the vessels dipping in the granuloma, that also suggests TB. However, the proptosis, which occurred in the past and which caused the cranial nerve palsies, is not something we see in the tuberculosis usually. So, and you did the biopsy of that proptosis, if I understood it correctly, and your biopsy was negative. So that is something which is still bothering me. It is not a straightforward case of tuberculosis, if at all. Yeah, so, I think that would, you know, if you had seen in the cavernous sinus something that would cause that multiple cranial nerve palsy, a granuloma there, that would have uh, also but been... already, I think, Dr. Helped. Avinash, they have done uh, uh, MRI. And yeah, so, it was so normal. That, that's what I'm saying. So it was normal. Yes. And again, here with the blood, you know, the, there's no, the, the retina being completely unaffected from the vessel point of view, again, would point to a choroidal lesion, uh, you know, which is a hematogenous spread. You know, Avinash, what, uh, like when she first came, she had proptosis and the proptosis responded to steroids. That is not very usual. Yeah, that, that would go with the sarcoid-like picture. That would go with the sarcoid or with lymphoma or whatever, you know. TB, if it is caused the disease which is involving the cavernous sinus, which is causing a granulomatous mass in the orbit, I personally have not seen a patient like that which has responded to steroids. So... We have that uh, issues together and we discuss it. And then we continue, see, now the mass is increasing. If you throw the patient now in tuberculosis treatment and uh, uh, steroid. Uh, and the mass, see how much now, starting to have more subretinal fluid. More, if you look in theory, there is retinal detachment and the fluorescent angiography increase intensity, all the areas that around more and more with hypofluorescent rings surrounding the original uh, lesions. 
And this is the subretinal fluid where involving the macula and inferior as well. Uh, uh, if you look for the ICG, it showed that hypofluorescence areas with enlarged, mm -hmm. you know, the uh, uh, deep uh, choroidal uh, large blood vessels. Again, late with the same thing. This is the OCT now showed that more subretinal fluids coming on and the situation getting more terrible now. It's not that as we see. We did ultrasound and you see the lesion, how it is it? It is dome shape. And uh, as follow up, the lesion is 6.47 millimeter in elevation with 10 millimeter, 43 millimeter in transfer diameters. Uh, the, the opinion of uh, ultrasound expert is still there that cannot rule out malignancy in this case. So really we are in trouble now. What we have to do next? Uh, what is happening to the right eye? To what? Right what eye. to the right eye? The right eye is okay as it is. No active lesions or inflammations on it. And the proptosis? Yeah, yeah. and the proptosis is, uh, it's not anymore proptosis and all the clear nerve palsy were resolved. We have done PET CT scan. Uh, we sent it to the to the oncologist and up on their examination they said that the patient doesn't need a uh, bit scan and there is really uh, no uh, real indications in this case i mean she's having any be... any any chest problem dr hassan and... no at all no cuff no uh, hemoptosis uh, no even that contact with the tuberculosis patients although the patient is living in mecca and X-ray, I mean, during this period, because now more than one year, is there any change in the X chest X-ray? No. And the CT general health of the patient hasn't it, changed. It is a healthy patient. It doesn't seem that he's having any uh, weight loss, loss or weight. fever or yes. And her CBC with the normal, even though, all the times. I would do PET CT scan. Yeah, PET scan because she could have a, uh, some sort of a cull because it is not improving with getting worse of, on treatment. Because of uh, calcified nodules in the breast, I sent her for mammogram and turned it negative as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, my personally, I contacted, it is, uh, he is my uh, colleagues, the one who is responsible for oncology and having the PET scan. And he said, Hassan, it is not need for that at all. But there is no other evidence of tuberculosis. No evidence at all, except the BBD test. And, because uh, we can drug resistant TB, um, new vascular membranes with TB, but the first thing is we have to rule out everything else. And malignancy or masquerade would be a very important thing to rule out before we think of, you know, non-response to TB treatment. So let us to see what's happened after. Uh, I have one question from YouTube, actually. There is a, a YouTube follow up for us. They are asking any history of PST kina court in a bust? Uh, kina court in this patient? Yeah. No, no. Not a known HIV? No. Uh, no, uh, uh, the patient, yani, actually we screened here. Uh, I don't remember that we did uh, HIV or not. But uh, uh, based on her health status and history, she is not having any con any, any sexual in contact with, uh, she is actually a, a single lady and no blood transfusion. So we continued with our course of the treatment. And was she receiving corticosteroids along yeah, with- Yeah, oral steroid with uh, uh, anti-tuberculosis medication, all four medications. So this is her pictures after six weeks from initiation of the treatment. The legion being subsided, subsided the, and the OCT is getting back. So it was probably TB. We do not know whether she is responding to steroids or to anti TB drugs. If My I can, question, if I was thinking. I was thinking about paradoxical, you know, uh, reactions Listening, yeah. in such patient. It might be with starting the anti-tuberculosis in the early, there is reaction so that there is usually getting worse. And then with the time is getting 
respond. Uh, for that reason, we put it in brackets. It is possibility of uh, a paradoxical reaction in the early course of the treatment and then grasping on and get the response. Uh, okay. Uh, if you look at your picture, the previous slide, when she showed worse name, yes. can we go back to the previous slide? The one before? Yeah. This is the one. Yes. If you see these vessels which are going along the lower temporal, they seem to be kind of, yeah, this is the thing. They seem to be kind of dipping into the granuloma. To me, this particular sign is very important that it could be TB. But again, you know, you have to rule out everything else before you actually say it is TB. We do inject anti-VEGF injections in these eyes because experimental models have very beautifully shown that TB is a VEGF-driven phenomenon. So that produces these kind of abnormal vessels. And even when you see the fluorescein, there is a central area which is very hyper. And I thought it was some, this one, there was some kind of retinal angiomatous proliferance, rap kind of a lesion developing these. So anti-VEGF and to be, I mean, we have published also, though I'm not advocating that, that even monotherapy with anti-VEGF actually takes care of these granulomas because when you cut the VEGF supply to the granulomas, they regress on their own. And the second is like what you are saying is paradoxical worsening. Many a times when we start anti-TB drugs, we kind of are scared of giving steroids. We, we, we you know, give half dose are but many of these patients would require a very full dose one to 1.5 milligram per kg per day uh, and if they show paradoxical worsening and if you are very sure that it is tuberculosis and not anything else you can actually supplement it with intravitreal methotrexate or ozotex so that is the way to go, but that's how I will approach because you still have only one test positive, Montius test, and rest everything was, uh, you know, it could be TB, it could not be TB. So I would still, I personally would have done PET for her. So whether physician tells to do it or not, I would just get it done because I feel more peaceful that I have ruled out something, but it's a beautiful case. Okay, Dr. Hassan, because you're already running behind the time. So, and we have one question, I'll raise hand. If you finish, then we can give a, a chance for someone to, to ask his questions. Well, this is, uh, it was challenging case, as you see, uh, thinking about possibility of giving intrafetrial injections in this case, especially- Something new, are... something new. Some, no, that's all. The patient is being, yeah, and he respond lately with anti fgf treatment. And till now, we are in 2020. I'm following this patient. Her fusion is returning back to 2030. No further, uh, uh, no further, you know, attacks or uh, granuloma that developed. In the same times, the patient continued her, uh, you know, uh, finished her course of uh, anti-tuberculosis, and we kept her only now in uh, Imuran to keep sure things are uh, under, under under control. And we don't, uh, we actually, I mean, her situation is stable till now. But uh, back to what uh, Dr. Fishali said, this is one eyed patient almost, and touching her by any means, it's really, it was need to think many times before we go for uh, any, uh, uh, you know, intrafetal injection. And that time, I mean, even though the fluorescent angiography, uh, it didn't uh, show up Clearly, there is, you know, choroidal nephascan brains for me. So uh, uh, that's why I'm not really that time is really pushing to give intrafetrial injection. Uh, uh, intrafetrial methotrexate, it could help in such patient. But giving just only without coverage of anti-tuberculosis, anti it might be a little bit, uh, you know. Uh, uh, 
after NIT under the cover for paradoxical words. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the only thing that found in this patient positive PBD, positive quantiferon, and negative all the things. So that's give me the power to uh, continue my treatment. And when you get deep in the tuberculosis response, we're looking for the paradoxical, you know, and uh, for that reason, we said, okay, we don't have to give up, continue our treatment and see what's happened. And uh, really, uh, while I'm pushing the patient to go for PET scans, I saw her just only one week before getting to my oncologist to make sure, and her situation being respond. I don't believe that if there is the possibility of metastasis, it will be respond like that. Yeah. Correct. But, yeah, I mean, uh, thank you, Dr. Hassan. Uh, there is anything, or you have anything to finish before this one? No, no. For this case, okay. Done with it. Okay. Like okay. We already for... run. We are run behind the time of your. Okay. So one case, you see, it take a long time of discussion. So it's very interesting case. Uh, we have. Uh, uh, can you open the mic for Dr. Ahmed Muhammad? Okay. You want to ask a question, please, Mr. John? Uh, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, Muhammad, and there is one, his name only by the name of the phone, Galaxy Note, also raise the hand. And we have uh, Surava Baya also from, uh, she raised hand also. So three of them, can you open the first, if there is any response from any one of them? Yes, from Galaxy Note. Okay, please. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to kindly ask. Uh, can you, like, can you just it... let us who is with us, please? Because it's showing my without... is, uh, I'm from Oman, Dr. Tahir. Uh, okay. My question was just uh, what when we see the lesion on the B scan, is it possible that we could have taken like fine needle aspiration cytology for it or something like that in okay. order to make okay. our okay. Cell more? Okay. I would like to show one thing in the, in the, in the, in the, if you look for the lesion here, centrally, it is a little bit, you know, having destroyed changes internally, if you look. So I, I compare this is with the other lesions like, you know, amelitic melanoma or melanoma or metastasis, and which is not the same as it is. Yani. And here, if you look for the, uh, 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 you know, reflectivity of the lesions is not really go with the, uh, you know, the, with, the, with, the, with the known lesions of uh, melanoma. So uh, uh, putting mm -hmm. in your mind one-eyed patient as well, it's making the case more challenging. Can I okay. Is it possible, Yani? Mean, the question is, is it possible to do a, a pan needle aspiration? Okay, Dr. Yeah. Bishali, can you comment, please? Yeah, I have tried doing it long time ago. The problem is, FNAC is invasive procedure. And secondly, the granuloma is very well contained in the subretinal space, and it's a caseous necrosis. So most of the time, you're not able to get good material. And the infection, which was restricted to subretinal space now comes into well, yeah, which is, yeah. Yeah. Never in, do that. in case the yeah. case the case not responding at that time we can continue to do mri and then we have to look for the biopsy or vitrectomy uh, 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 diagnostic vitrectomy in these cases but not at this level where i am i'm there yet Okay. Yeah, but yeah, with, yeah, with yeah. these choroidal lesions, because they are so well contained, again, yeah, the moment you intervene, you are basically spreading the uh, there is an infection to be more seeding it. So, uh, looking at that fluorescein, you know, you realize that you know you shouldn't actually intervene. Uh, yeah, but if you look for the fluorescein, there is a hint. There is hypofluorescent in yeah. the in this lesion from the beginning, and if and so in the uh, ICG which is really, this is not the characteristic of the possibility of malignancy. Although it could be, but yeah, I mean, mostly it is more with the inflammatory lesions. Can we because have another question? So we can well have another right? one, raise hand, please. If you can have the another one. We have another more too, because Dr. Hassan already exceed more than five, 10 minutes. So uh, any other uh, is ready to ask there? Sorry, Abaya. Surav, Surav Baya, sorry. John, is there anyone? If not, uh, so we can have uh, another. Yes, is there any question? I'm waiting them for accepting. Okay, if not accepting, meanwhile, so we can have another question here. What is the investigation? It's uh, it's diagnostic for ophthalmic TB. These are general questions. If Dr. Hassan or Dr. Tijali, if they want to comment. 
I think Dr. Fishali is the one who is really okay. Please, Dr. Fishali, is there what 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 the investigation? It it is diagnostic for ophthalmic TP. Nothing. Nothing. It's good. Investigation. You just do very good. I want this one very fast, direct and answer questions. Um, uh, uh, is it uh, a Toulouse hand syndrome? No. Um, Not the left eye. Yeah, no. maybe I think uh, uh, somebody is asking about a uh, uh, role of uh, vitreous biopsy. I think, Dr. Hassan, you already uh, mentioned this one. Um, uh, what also, again, what is the role of uh, vitreous biopsy in such cases to confirm TB? It is already have mentioned, Dr. Brassan, also, is this a, a vascularized TB granuloma? Yes. 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 Okay. Which is where so, the anti VEGF is helpful in these was, cases. Was systemic steroids started same day with anti TB or 48 hours later? No, it uh, so, started only yani, 48 hours. 48 hours after the uh, anti tuberculosis. Anti tuberculosis. Why not to do a uh, fans of the region? Uh, fine needle, you mean? Yeah, fine needle aspiration. Yeah. We, we answered it already. We answered already answered yeah, this one. Okay, how do to explain right eye finding and uh, CN paralysis, proptosis, uh, and did the picture in right eye has changed after or not? No, it is uh, uh, subsided. No, uh, the balances, were, uh, the pulses were resolved. The proptosis is getting subsided down, and this is the patient who was treated as case of sarcoidosis before it's coming to us. Okay. Uh, uh, is there any relation between right and left, the same disease, Dr. Hassan? Well, it is difficult because uh, I saw a lot of tuberculosis, uh, ocular tuberculosis, and even Dr. Fishali, but complicated case with multiple uh, cranial nerve palsy, proptosis, and granuloma. Actually, uh, I never really uh, saw such case like that. Uh, another question. Sorry, Can you? Yeah, your voice a little bit. Uh, can you just uh, repeat, Doctor? Uh, I said it could be tubercular sarcoid. There is a complete spectrum between the sarcoid and TB, oh. and we have which actually defined it like four or five stages: sarcoid, 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 TB, TB, sarcoid, TB, TB. So it seems yeah. a kind of blend between the two: tubercular sarcoid, where you don't really know what it is. Okay, this is another uh, general question. When do you do TB gold test? Yeah, TB? Oh, go, go ahead, go ahead, doctor. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. yeah, doctor Bichali. Yeah, TB gold generally is done as a first line of investigation along with PPD. And in some countries, PPD is not available. So TB gold is done as a. Okay. There is another question. Uh, how often do you need to give systemic treatment such as isotroxate or uh, imuran during or after ATT such as this case? Well, actually, because now this patient is a special case, actually, it is one eyed patient and I would like to protect her as much as I can. So after the nine months of anti-tuberculosis, I kept patient on, uh, uh, on um, uh, immunosuppressive imuran uh, uh, but the, the recurrency in such cases of terrorist could be happened in any patient. So uh, by the time being, I finished the course. So uh, really, I, I get out of patient of tuber uh, anti tuberculosis medications. You know, uh, anti tuberculosis medication is not free of of uh, side effects. So once you finished your course, then you can treat your patients uh, uh, as any patient that having possibility because tuberculosis could be happened because of direct infusion of uh, myobacterium or could be an, uh, uh, related to uh, antibodies related to uh, tuberculosis. So for in the other hand that I have to keep her at least in low doses of immunosuppressive medications to make sure that she is not. And with the time uh, and follow-ups, I can see how is the uh, eyes behave. If there is no more reactions in the eye, then I can take her out of her medication gradually. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hassan. Uh, why patient had uh, cyanica in right eye while it looked normal? 
Yeah, because this is what we think and we're talking about uh, that could be sarcoidosis tuberculosis, you know, case. And she had some at, uh, attacks in the past while she is having, you know, the diagnosis of sarcoidosis. But when she came okay. to me, she was quiet. Okay, we need only a fast and direct answer because the time is running, so we can get more questions. When I should consider anti-VGF for TB posterior uveitis, Dr. Abinash? When I should consider anti-VGF for TB posterior uveitis? Anti-VGF uh, for TB, so in, uh, I would say when you, firstly, when you see, uh, you can, see when you have a secondary CNV, developing, that would be a good uh, circumstance. You okay. can, in these uh, granulomas, you can give anti-VEGF. And also in cases where you have a lot of uh, occlusive disease with uh, uh, neovascularization, uh, you know, you can treat that with anti-VEGF along with the PRP. Thank you, Dr. Anish. Uh, does proptosis of right eye improve with anti-tuberculosis, Dr. Hassan? It has been improved before we have the uh, problems in the rift eye. Yeah. Okay. How long ATT treatment? How many drugs? Uh, actually, there is a, a protocol for anti-tuberculosis medications. You start in full medication for for uh, for the first two months, uh, and then uh, take out. You know, continue with the. Uh, uh, I mean that with the, with the, uh, with INH and uh, rifampicin and uh, for continue for nine months. This is the protocol that we followed. Four okay. months and then continue with uh, two medications. Okay, I think this repeated question, but we can go very fast. What happened to the right eye already you answer? How do you explain proptosis in the right eye? Uh, as about maybe sarcoidosis, as you say, but it was uh, negative. Yeah, it was negative. This is what we said. There is could be mixed picture, clinical picture between sarcoidosis and tuberculosis. We called it sarcoidosis tuberculosis. So this is, could be explained the, the uh, proptosis that happened in the right eye. Okay, a last question. And uh, can you, Dr. Vishali, start to prepare for sharing? Uh, a question uh, to all uh, patient, uh, sorry, uh, the urbanists. If you, all of you are just BO uh, when you use uh, rifampicin during anti-TB treatment course? Yes, I, I do, I do. You can uh, double it because uh, uh, rifampicin is a cytochrome P450 inducer, and so it uh, it doubles the rate of uh, prednisolone metabolism. So you can uh, you you must increase the dose, in my opinion. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hassan, for this very interesting. And it takes more than 45 minutes. You see, we thought only 10 minutes, 15 minutes. You see, but you know, we are preparing another uh, cases. But this is the but, Yeah, the uveitis, but also it was very interesting case. Uh, at, uh, today, actually, I would like to uh, uh, introduce Dr. and Professor Vichali Gupta. Uh, we are honored to be with us today. Uh, Dr. Vichali is uh, a chief of Vitreo Retinal and Uvia Advan uh, Advanced Eye Center. Uh, I don't know if I will uh, say the name properly. You can correct me, Dr. Uh, Big Marank, uh, Chandigarh, India. Is that right? Uh, and yeah, Doctor. By the way, Doctor Abichali is our well known uh, 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 figures in uh, uveitis, and she is lastly uh, and uh, just uh, announced her uh, uh, book. So she will give us uh, a little bit information about the book, maybe in the end of the presentation. Uh, Doctor Abichali, welcome and thank you for your presentation. Present with us. Thank you, Doctor Amri Abinash. Truly honored to be participating and speaking to you all. So I'm going to talk of the clinical sense. Why don't we see what we see? Because we have lost the art of observation, lost the art of patience. So I'm going to show you a case. This is a 23 year old man who comes to us with decreased vision last two days. Patient is under follow-up in pediatrics and he's having a lot of systemic problems, recurrent subcutaneous swellings in the arm and the feet, undergone multiple skin biopsies and all of them were indeterminate. So one biopsy indicated that he had IgG4 related disease. The other differential was SAPHO 
I will tell you what that is, but anyways, a little bit about IgG4, which is a kind of immune mediated multi-system disease that involves a lot of autoimmune conditions in the eye. The differential diagnosis was SAPHO, which is synovitis, acne, pustulosis, hyperostosis, and osteosis. So now, patient has this backdrop, and he comes to us with rapidly decreasing visual acuity since last one week. And he's carrying this OCT with him, which was done outside. So what you see here is something is happening in the outer retina and there is this hyperreflective shadows. This is what his eye looked like. The vision is counting finger one meter. And I would like any one of you to comment if you wish at this stage. Yeah, Dr. Avi, if you so, have any comment. Uh, yeah, so I mean, there looks to be a serpiginoid looking lesion you know it starts at the disc and it's creeping forward in that uh, serpiginoid uh, yeah. manner and would correspond to the outer retinal uh, changes seen on the OCT. OCT so it looked like kind of choroidal inflammation serpiginoid and uh, this was the left eye which you know again had similar kind of a lesion this is the autofluorescence. Now, autofluorescence was something which we did not expect to see because the pattern yeah. was different than what we would have expected in serpiginous light. And this was the left eye autofluorescence. So we did the repeat OCT and the OCT by now shows that there has been a significant progression since what we saw the last time. You can see these lesions in the outer retina which are increasing. And this is not the lesions we generally see in the outer mm. retina in a usual patient with serpiginous. No, are we? No, not at all. So, And uh, uh, autofluorescence is very pathognomonic for uh, in, in serpiginous, which in this case is completely unexpected. So... And <laughs> this looks was... like a, a acute, uh, so uh, 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 idiopathic maculopathy, AIM sort of yeah, picture. So this is how it was looking at, and it's acute maculopathy. Yeah. So we did the usual investments. And you see on fluorescein, we are seeing some leakage from the vessels, but not something you would expect in a patient of acute maculopathy are choroiditis. Yeah. Again, yeah. This is the right eye, very unusual. Mm -hmm. He's already on steroids and uh, he's a patient of IgG4. So we were going in that direction, thinking what it could be. So we had all the possible crazy diagnosis with us. So we also did ICG. And if you look at the ICG, this is showing hypo. Yeah. And again, in the late phase, it's not showing the way it should be. I mean, it's not pathognomic of anything. Sure. Look at the autofluorescence. The autofluorescence is again, disturb lesions most of the places. So what is it? OCT angio did not add much, except it showed there was damage happening at the level of RPE. Any thoughts by anybody at this point of time? There is one comment yeah. is uh, someone is saying maybe it's a serbignos like TB. Yeah, that is what we thought. But when we look at the autofluorescence, when we look at the fluorescein, when we look at the ICG, it does not look like serpiginous choroiditis at all. And then we took the history. And why we took the history? Because if you look at these lesions, and I think I can quickly go back to the pathognomic feature, which I would like to discuss in this patient. When we were looking at this patient and I was showing you the autofluorescence, 
Now look at this thing, which is on top. Look at this thing and look at these linear tracks. Now choroid is a very lobular structure. So when it gets inflamed, either it is focal or it is diffuse. It cannot show these linear crisscross kind of patterns. And similarly, you see in the left eye. If you look at this OCT, just keep in mind this OCT, which is showing you pillar-like elevations here involving the outer retina. This is very characteristic of laser-induced acute maculopathy. So this okay, is can we have one? Uh, we have one uh, raised hand. Let yes. us see if he has have a comment. Uh, can you open the mic for uh, Dr. Ahmed Muhammad, please? Let us see his opinion also. Okay, you can continue, Dr. Richard, till he opened the mic. Because we, we looked at the pattern and we thought it could be laser. And when we asked the patient, he said he had bought this laser five, six months ago. And they play with the friends. They shine into each other's eye. And when we looked at the literature, you can look at the similar tracks which have been shown on autofluorescence and look at the similar kind of the OCT, the one which has been reported in past. So what we need to do is to look for these small, if you can see this small little white in the iris, these are the laser burns in our patient. And you can see it here also. So you have to look for these. So this is what we have published in retinal cases and brief reports. But what I want to highlight is simply because patient has IgG4 nephropathy and some kind of choroiditis does not mean the patient is going to be inflammatory. Always try to look at the phenotype. If the phenotype is not fitting into what you think it should be fitting, talk to the patient, get the history, and broaden your differential diet. So should I move to the next and then oh, take- This is an excellent. So let us see if there is any questions for you. Yeah, there is one is his was comment, argon laser marks. Yes, uh, that is what it is, laser-induced maclopathy. Okay. Uh, someone is say uh, nematode tracks in one of the autofluorescence. That was our differential diagnosis because we thought they could be nematode-induced tracks. And this is what I want to show here again. Once you see track like this, acute history, but on OCT, you are seeing these lesions in the outer retina. Laser history has to be taken because laser induces acute maculopathy, which can cause this. Okay, can we have now yeah. two come? Okay, let, let us see uh, the raise hand. Can you open the mic for the, anyone? Ahmed Mohammed is there. So, Dr. Somali. Sulayman. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, this is Dr. Shomali. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead, uh, Dr. Shomali. Yeah, uh, nice to see you, Dr. Vishali here in Oman. Never expected to see you here. Uh, another thing uh, which I wanted to ask is how do you treat these patients of laser maculopathy? Because I have received one case with acute injury by uh, blue laser. And uh, we just uh, left the patient with uh, anti-inflammatory topical, uh, topical drop, and then he recovered in six weeks. It was a minor injury. But in these cases, how do you go ahead with the case? There are no uh, algorithms or this thing. I did try corticosteroids because, to be honest, I was worried about his IgG4. And before I actually got the history of laser because the patient was not giving and I was not expecting to begin with. So we did give him systemic steroids. Yeah. Somehow they did not work. Uh, but usually if there is any patient, Dr. Hichali, uh, and he was exposed to laser treatment. I think this is a question of Dr. Uh, Somali. Uh, what is the treatment? No, there is no treatment. No, there is no treatment. This is what we want everybody to know, that we don't have any treatment. Just to see the patient, they usually improve by themselves, right? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, we have another question from Dr. Suleiman. Uh, I mean, raise hand. Dr. Suleiman, if you are alive there, you can go ahead. 
Dr. Suleiman. Hello? Dr. Suleiman is one of the uh, really uh, uh, Ar Ar specialized, specialized persons in the laser uh, uh, laser uh, injuries, and I'm sure that he will add a lot. Uh, he is there or not? We are waiting for him. Dr. Suleiman, are you there? Or if we can, Dr. Ahmed Muhammad? Dr. Okay, okay. So I we will wait. If there is anyone, Mr. John, uh, you can open the mic for them anytime they are there. Even they can. Uh, Dr. Us. Ahmad, it's open now. Okay, Ahmad, go ahead, Dr. Ahmad. Yes, thank you so much. Shall I go on with my case? Or? Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, no, we are talking with Dr. Ahmad Muhammad, not Dr. Ahmad Salam. Okay. So sure. this is a raised hand from outside. Sorry, Dr. Ahmad. Hello. No, how are yeah, I'm sorry for joining, Lee. Thank you so much. Okay, John, I'm talking about if the one who is raised hand is ready. It's ready, but no response. Uh, okay, response if there is no response, okay, we can go to the next case, Dr. Vishali. Could, Could I have? Yeah, Could Dr. I have, yeah, I Dr. have Dr. comments about the case. We, okay. uh, there is uh, uh, one of the lesion called paracentral acute middle maculopathy. Uh, it could happen that, but when I looked for the uh, 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 OCT angio, it doesn't show any cabinet drop out, so that the hallmark of the uh, paracentral acute uh, middle. But in this case, you know, mostly it doesn't seem that an acute situation secondary to the laser pointer uh, uh, reactions. It might be that uh, reactivate some thing in the you know in the uh, retinal cells so give that behavior because when you look for the for the lesion some of them is already active some of them is still organic to be scarring so is there any relations between that so that the lasers you know wave that enter to the eye is having this uh, reactions because we do a lot of laser in our you know uh, uh, practice and we couldn't see such uh, lesions uh, Dr. D.B., that was exactly my question, and Bailey Front helped me solving this. And the wavelength of the laser, which the commercially available Chinese laser, is the one, and it moves like this. They throw it directly, and it goes on and off. And these lesions, after the acute insult, are known to progress. I thought it was going to be a one-time injury and the patient is done with the laser, it will not. But Bailey told me this patient is going to progress and the lesions did progress for a week or so because of the inflammatory response induced by a very large amount of the laser that has gone into that. So we did try steroids, but unfortunately for this patient, even that did not work. And there was off and on history, like some scars were old, some were new, because he was doing it over a period of time. Okay, uh, thank you. Can we go to the next case? Uh, yeah, this is a short case. This is a young girl and she presented to our clinic, no systemic disease, nothing. And this is the fundus of both eyes when she presented to us. Any comments? Okay. Any comment from the Dr. Ahmed or Dr. Hassan, Dr. Avi? How old the how old is the the girl? She's a very young girl. I think she was twenty six. Yeah. How the vision it was? How is the vision? Her vision? Or vision was dropping in both the eyes, and uh, she just had these dilated vessels, and these whitish lesions happening in the periphery. Do you have any systemic disease, Dr. Vijali? She did not have when she presented to us. No she systemic just, I mean, I mean, these tortuous vessels and swollen discs, and those, those lesions look like auto-infarcted things that you get in some vascular diseases. Absolutely. So I'm not going to discuss. I'm just going to talk about the role of OCT a bit. So you see this blood vessel. So we, we were kind of wanting to see what is happening to the OCT. And if you see the blood vessel on the OCT here, 
they are hyper inside. That's not the way the normal vascular pattern of the blood vessels on OCT is. And this is to show you again more clearly, the blood vessels are all hyperreflective inside. So this homogeneous hyperreflectivity of blood flow, if you see, think of hyperviscosity syndromes. So we just ordered everything and she came out to be a patient of chronic myeloid leukemia. So she didn't have any, any systemic, any, any complaint? She did any not. Other, so, any other complaint? After that, she underwent, she was anemic, but she did not have any complaint. She just complained of decreased vision and that was her presenting complaint to us. And we were the one who first suggested to get the blood work up and then she came out to be leukemic positive. She received treatment. So I just quickly want to show that normal blood vessels have this pattern. This is called the pattern of eight, as in eight. So you see this pattern. If you are seeing the loss of this pattern, eight reflectivity pattern, always think about leukemias and uh, this is the patient we reported in ophthalmology retina as loss of pattern of A. And you can see that after treatment, this pattern is returning back to normal. So this is just a small case to discuss about how leukemia could present. And if you are suspecting OCT is something we all do, but if you do OCT through the vessels and you see this loss of reflectivity or homogeneous reflectivity, don't miss out on that patient. Always rule out hyperviscosities, including leukemia. This patient after treatment, she improved, you mean? And her pattern also started coming back. This is after treatment. This is before. This is just four weeks uh after. Which is there any photo for the fundus, can, fundus after the treatment? Yeah, I have not put that. Okay. Okay, any, any comment or question from the panelists here? The top and the bottom, the blood vessels viscosity is coming down. The caliber is improving already. And visual so, IPT improved, right? Any, is any, this something any... unique, Dr. Gupta, for... Okay. Is this something unique for uh, increased viscosity or uh, leukemia in particular, or, or it's more with like any uh, disease that will increase blood viscosity? We do not know. It has been described mainly for leukemias right. and patients of Baldestrom's globulinemia. Two patients have been reported mm -hmm. for the third one to report. But this is not something we actually look for in our patients of uh, leukemias and hyperviscosity. Now we are going to look for it. You know. That's very That's nice. No, fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's very interesting. But we have many questions, so we can't go to the questions. If there is a time, so we can go to the third test. Uh, Dr. Uh, Suleiman, Al Suleiman, he's raised hand also again. Can you open for Dr. Suleiman? Yeah, hello, Dr. Gupta. Good to hear from you. Good to hear from you. He was my favorite fellow. Okay, yeah. Dr. Suleiman, go uh, ahead. It was my honor to be your fellow. So I have uh, comments regarding the case of uh, laser maculopathy. Uh -huh. So we reported, we reported on uh, blue laser uh, maculopathies, yes. which are not quite the same as uh, the green laser and red laser maculopathies that followed our publication. And I believe the reason is not the wavelength itself, uh, but rather the uh, power of the laser. Absolutely. So the blue, la the blue lasers are uh, very powerful. They are like more than 500 milliwatts. So yeah. the, the one that we had, that we measured was 750 milliwatts. Yeah. This was a heavy laser, heavy duty laser they call it. And they are just available on internet, which is very unfortunate. So, like Indian rupees 500, which is, you know, so, but this was actually green laser, heavy duty yes. laser. So, this is what he had yes. used. And then they put some caps on it and they create different patterns and they keep on shining. It, 
and what he said was he reflected it in the mirror of the car and from there it was reflecting back and he was looking at that so you know yes yes these are the green the green laser and uh, are uh, and red laser are usually less than 100 100 150 milliwatts so yes. they are not very powerful they are still above the limit uh, the acceptable limit uh, is 5 milliwatts so they are like uh, uh, they are 100 milliwatts and they they cause these kind of injuries the linear uh, tracks that you you showed nicely uh, however, the blue laser does not cause this. The blue laser causes an instant damage. And uh, this damage is usually in the form of either outer retinal disruption, sometimes full thickness macular hole, sometimes it, it disrupts a blood vessel and leads to bleeding. And, and, and patients cannot stare at blue laser compared to green laser and, uh, and the red laser. And it is all related to the power of the laser, not the wavelength. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmad. Yes, Dr. Vishal, you can comment. Yes. Yeah. Any comment, Dr. Vishal? I agree with him. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ahmad, for your sharing your experience with us also and your comment. Uh, we are having a, a, letter, a few questions before. So how would you different this from solar retinopathy uh, in pathology? Solar retinopathy is a one-time event. So what you see, there is a very small hole which is located in the outer retina and the patient by and large does not have a progressive loss of vision. You incidentally note it, solar retinopathy doesn't have what you see here, damage to the outer retina, the diffuse pattern of the disease and the linear tracks going all over. Most of the time, it's just incidentally discovered. Patients going on with amblyopia, unexplained visual loss, you see a small hole at the level of the outer retina on OCT. It doesn't have a diffuse pattern like this. Okay. Uh, this is a question I don't know for the first case for Dr. Hassan or for your case, Dr. Vishali. Is there is xenophilia on CBC was test for parasitic infection done? I think must be for him. Yeah, for Dr. Hassan. Not for me, maybe. Uh, for the yeah, for, for the case, yeah. Actually, yeah. we are actually we not we didn't do that. But when you do the complete uh, uh, blood count, you will find the Osnivils how it is, and accordingly, then you can react. But in this case, actually, no history of uh, you know uh, uh, throttling or mean that getting to the areas where there is a lot of parasites uh, there. Uh, usually we do the uh, stool analysis, you know, in these patients, and we look for uh, possibility of parasites, but we couldn't find any of this. We also did not do. Okay. Uh, there is any comment from Dr. Arab Adinwala, Eagle's disease. Uh, I think he meant eel's disease, but then yeah. he said no. Or uh, eels, sorry, this and eels, 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 yeah, yeah. Oh, eels, eels. You mean that uh, TB vasculitis? Yes. Well, uh, I mean, there was no yeah, any, uh, obvious, yeah, any, uh, visible yeah, any signs of vasculitis in my case by fluorescent angiography and even clinically. So uh, we are not, uh, yeah, maybe they are uh, confused with uh, what we, Dr. Fishali, mentioned that when you see the blood vessels. Uh, getting in the uh, center of the regions and you have to express the possibility of vasculopathy involved in this uh, granomas and choroid and it might be they confuse it but there is no signs of active vasculitis in that case each disease does not produce granulomas yes. okay the uh, vasculitis yeah. dr brasan asking uh, i think this for dr vishali are these angioma yeah the first thing here yeah, the temporal one, temporal one. My resident brought to me, he diagnosed it as angiomas. Yeah. Uh, but the thing is, these are not angiomas. Even the chronic myeloid leukemias are known to produce these features. So one has to be very careful to label it as angioma. And if you look at the blood vessels, they are whitish here. Most of the blood vessels, if you look at them, they are whitish because of the change in the viscosity. 
So angioma, the blood vessels would be red. They will not become whitish in color. Yeah. In addition to this case, to this uh, signs is the disc swelling. Yeah. I mean, when you see such patient with young patient with disc swelling and infiltrate, you have to think about leukemia. Uh, yeah. This is one. But what the doctor uh, Fishali mentioned that to show up is this peculiar sign that show by OCT. When you see it in this patient, the figure of eight of the blood vessels. It's an excellent. Centered hemorrhages, if you see. The uh, there is a question also. There is a role of PHL, please. Role of? Uh, von, von Hebel, von Hebel, Lindy. Von Hebel, uh, Lindy. Yeah, von Hebel, Lindy. That yeah. is the same thing as angiomas. That is what we are differentiating. Disc edema, blood vascularity, these blood vessels starting from the disc, the white color of the blood vessels and the retinal hemorrhages with white center. These are the points against uh, the uh, Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Bichari, for very interesting cases. Uh, I think we'll uh, keep the last uh, case, maybe if we have a time at the end. So now we can go uh, to uh, Dr. Ahmed uh, Salam. Dr. Ahmed, if you are uh, ready to go. Yes, Dr. Ahmed ready. Salam, he is Associate Professor of Ophthalmology, uh, uh, Director of Ibiatis Service, Retina Specialist, uh, Jones Eye Institute University of uh, Arkansas from Medical uh, Science Arkansas. US. Arkan? Arkansas. Uh, Arkansas. Uh, Arkansas. 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 Okay. Yeah. From, for Medical Science. Uh, Dr. Ahmad, thanks to you to be with, with us, and we are honored to be with us also, and you can go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, are my slides clear? Uh, no, you are not sharing it. You are, okay. We are seeing you. Yeah, just one second. Okay. Yes, yes go. now it's okay. Okay, fantastic. Let me, sorry, let me just bring up the slide. Okay. Uh, so uh, I just uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Amri and Dr. Avinash and all the uh, and Dr. Eldeep and Dr. Gupta for uh, giving me the chance to speak in this uh, uh, exciting uh, webinar. Uh, I'm just going to share with you a case of a 34-year-old male who came to our emergency uh, department because he was hit uh, by a rock in the eye. Then he was seen by one of the optometrists who diagnosed him with cornea abrasion and gave him ointment. But the patient things are not settling down, and he has really severe pain and uh, reduced vision. So, um, bus history, hep C virus, uh, he had carpal tunnel and other orthopedic surgery, social history, nothing really significant except that uh, he works in landscaping and no intravenous drug use and no other, no meds. And on the right eye, which has the problem, his vision is counting fingers, and his anterior segment, uh, which I'm sorry, I don't have a photo for it, has flare cells on a hypopian one millimeter, posterior cyanica, and it's an injected eye, about one to two plus injection. So there's ongoing anterior, there's significant anterior segment inflammation with hypopia in this eye. Um, and pupil is very small and cyanica that we couldn't really see anything from the fundus except vitreous haze. So no fundus view. Other eyes, completely normal, 20-20 vision. So you got a B-scan on him, and that's his B-scan here. So you got some vitreous opacities, and some of the vitreous lesions are connecting to the uh, retina in the posterior pole. That's all what we can see. So the question is, you have this patient with perineuveitis, hypopian, and nothing else really, except the weird history of being hit in the eye with maybe a rock, which is not very consistent. So what shall we do? So- uh, Can you have any comment from uh, the, uh, our panelists well, What's here? the differential diagnosis? Okay, Dr. Vishali or Hassan, Dr. Abinash. Was she outdoors? Uh, pardon, I beg your pardon? Uh, I mean, was she outdoor doing some activity when she was hit? Yeah, so really when we dig more into this history, he was saying, I think I maybe hit, he was driving his convertible car and he said, maybe something hit me in the eye. So really, I think it was a red herring. It wasn't really that he was definitely hit. 
could could it be that he has a detachment or a dialysis have you seen yeah. that on the true i mean he could be i mean that's one of the differential diagnoses i mean he had hypopian inflammation and vitreous opacities on the b scan we couldn't see any retinal detachment we just saw vitreous opacities connecting with the retina so our like initial diagnosis was, was we're dealing with a case of panuveitis for you know the big differential diagnosis yeah. Whether Any IV I, drug use history or something like that? So, so, good. so when we ask initially, no, uh, in no intravenous drug use. Uh, and that's the differential diagnosis we had, a case of panuveitis. We're not really sure you were to head. So as Sue Lightman always told me, and I think Avi as well, if I've taught you something, always think inflammatory, infectious, and masquerade. So that's what I did inflammatory, infectious, and masquerade. So that's a big list here of uh, differential diagnosis. What was the glow like? Was it yellow glow or red glow? Uh, it was no red reflexory. I think it's an element of the anti sigmund inflammation, the vitreous, but also the procedure sinica. We couldn't get a picture even with the optus initially. So you think it is not related to the trauma? I, I, no, I don't think it's related to trauma. He was saying I, I was driving my convertible, something maybe hit me in the eye, not sure. And then after that, I vision is getting worse and continue to get worse. So I don't think it was related to the trauma. Mm -hmm. So thinking about Bahjat as one of the... Yeah, I mean, Bahjat, uh, whether it's LB27 because of the hypopian, but weird that there's pussy sigma involvement. Yes. Whether it's infectious, but why? I mean, so we, really what we did is what we usually do in this uh, broad situation, we have to cover arm uh, because anything else can wait except arm. So okay. ACTAP, we send sample for lab with a blood test, mainly syphilis and the other ones. And we started on atropine, pretforte and valcyclovir and decided to see the patient next day. Maybe we get a better fundus view. So my first message, really, if you're not sure we're dealing with panuveitis, most important to cover is infectious and most important to cover is viral uh, infectious because things can re get worse so quickly. Dr. Ahmed, if it is uh, a trauma and maybe there is an intraocular foreign body yeah. leading to this, uh, did we do so? We have to do, for example, x-ray and to see to rule out yeah, uh, that's foreign true. So really, when we dig more in the history, it was a completely a red herring. You know, it was like maybe something scratched my eye and and there was really nothing into that. And we did a B scan and we couldn't see anything. And we didn't really buy much into the history because he backed off this history and said, oh, no, it's like maybe something scratched my eye. One thing, a typical history is caterpillar hair in the eye. If he has been outdoor, something yeah. has, the caterpillar hair is known to produce end of mitis like acute and patient typically gives a history of scratching because the hair goes into that's actually the, yeah, that's an interesting one we didn't think of that yeah. how, how can you repeat Victoria Vichari sorry uh, the caterpillar hair okay uh, you know that's known to produce what used to be called ophthalmia nodosa a long time ago now we call yeah. it but UBM shows very nicely those hair which can be seen in the ciliary body. Can... I mean, we didn't really look for that. So uh, we didn't think of it. We didn't look for that. I mean, our differential diagnosis went this way when we felt that there was no history really significantly of trauma. But that's, yeah, that's a great yeah, point. A, yeah, ARN yeah. Is, a, is, a, is a really one of the things, especially in healthy persons. Uh, but usually the hypobian in the ARN is, is mostly is fibrinous, you know, the opposite, not that real hypobian, as we see in Bahjat or even though in leukemia or in cases of, uh, of indigenous endophthalmite. Indigenous, I'm not thinking about that at all because the patient is healthy, seems not sick. Sineke yeah. is also unusual. Yes, yes. Uh, I have a, a, a uh, okay. Dr. Hassan, if you want to continue, please go ahead. No, no, but putting that dissecting the differential diagnosis in the case, how yeah. it's going. So, so that's what I said. You know, ARN, it's okay, okay there, but it's not in the top of the list. Most my opinion. Okay, there but, is one comment or question. I want a, a comment from Dr. Ahmed about this one. 
uh, I'm not agree about what you say. CT scan looking for intraocular thrombosis. Do you agree to do something like that? Uh, but yeah, no, totally I agree. I mean, if the history is consistent, but some, how, someone... if there is a trauma, pardon? If there is a trauma, usually uh, you are afraid if there is a metallic, so CT scan, uh, it should, we should avoid to do CT scan if we are having uh, a trauma to the eye. We can see if there is a foreign body, interactive foreign body. Yeah, the history was not like this at all. And, you know, as I said, when we discussed that with him, that wasn't looked like the case at all. There was no entry site at all or anything to suspect. Um, you know, it was uh, clear and with the ultrasound, we didn't get anything. So really we didn't go th down this route because the history was like not supportive at all. So, but yeah, of course, I mean, if there's history to suggest foreign body, we get a CT, of course. So I totally agree. Okay, there is another comment. Tuxo is one differential diagnosis, do you think? Yeah. So if you look here, I think this is really a good point. And also uh, Dr. LD, Dr. Hassan's good point on hypopian is, is actually great. Although actually, interestingly, we had a case a few weeks ago uh, with hypopian really like, looked really like a leukemic hypopian and that was a patient of ARN. But yes, you, you're right, absolutely right. I think Beshet, HB27, endophthalmitis and medications are more before ARN on the, uh, on the list of uh, hypopian uveitis. So yeah, Toxo is definitely there. Um, you know, me, if, if there is a confusion between hypopion be being a malignant or infective when you are doing a TAP, do IL-6, IL-10 ratio. Yeah, we don't have access to it really in our hospital. Is that something accessible? In India and Saudi Arabia? Yeah, uh, yeah, in such case, we do uh, yeah, AC it's... taps in these cases, yeah. No, interleukin 6 and 10, do you have that? Yeah, yeah, we send it to the labs having the facility to that. And, and... actually, yeah, and we can wait. It's not just immediately you can get it, but uh, you can get yeah. it within three, four, five days. They help. Yeah, we have it. We yeah, we that. tried that with lymphoma patients before. We don't have access yeah. to interleukin 6 and 10 analysis. No, no, we do, and we have the... You know, one of the international labs is Biosensia. Usually they provide. Yeah. But I think right. the approach has been, is correct, is that you, you know, you do the immediate tap to look, to rule out infection. Then you can, con you know, you can start some sort of, uh, you know, some steroids uh, with, a, you know, with some degree of uh, trepidation, but you can start steroids and then perhaps get a better view of what's going on. Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly what we did. We, we wouldn't start systemic steroids because we, we don't do what we deal with, but our main interest, cover viral, start drops aggressively to try to clear up the view and then have a look. And that's what we did really here. And of course, you want to get syphilis out of the way. Syphilis can imitate anything. TB, unlikely, especially in, uh, in a Caucasian uh, um, uh, you know, um, person, uh, but... That's three really what, um, so we had valacyclovir started atropine and preforty. Next day, we had a better glimpse of the fundus and that's what we could see here. In, so what, uh, Dr. Ahmad, you start him on what treatment? Uh, we started him on uh, preforty drops, prednisone drops. Okay. Atropine drops and valacyclovir to cover just in case this is on until we get the labs out and see what's happening. And that's usually my approach for cases where you cannot really exclude ARN. So I would cover for acute retinal necrosis and then I have time to do to wait for labs and do other stuff. So, I mean, can I ask the colleagues here, would you do the same Dr. Gupta? Do you cover for ARN as well or? Not really, not to begin. Really. Because we do get reports uh, of the tap very fast. Okay, right. Dr. Hassan uh, or Dr. Abi, what, what you are usually doing? Uh, well, we, we, you know, we, uh, in, the, in the private setting, it's difficult because uh, uh, how, when you, when you try and bill for these things, it, it's very difficult. Uh, and so you have to be more pragmatic in, in what sort of tests you would do. But yeah, I, I agree that, you know, uh, again, trying to get a better view by ruling out 
as much as you can and uh, clearing up and then you can have more targeted treatment uh, okay, Dr. Ahmed, can we go ahead? The, I mean, the good thing really for, I mean, to take home is phallocyclovir is a very good medicine. You can give it outpatient and it works very, if you give a high dose of one gram TID or, um, uh, sorry, two gram TID or two gram QID, which is four times, you get very high bioavailability, uh, which is equivalent yeah. to IV acyclovir. So next day, better glimpse of the fundus. Uh, the indirect view was much better than this picture. So maybe in all fairness, I'll show you the picture a few more, few days afterwards, because it might be difficult to comment from this picture. Although you may see something here on the disc and outside. Uh, I don't, can you see my arrow there? There's yeah. the disc and the outside through the significant, through the vitreous and the bad anti segment view. But this is a picture few days after, especially with the Pusis Sanike being um, uh, disrupted. So that's a better picture. So here, I mean, we can see lesions re on the disc and outside where it looks like they are budding lesions. So uh, what we did now is revise the history and we've asked him again about intravenous drug use. So what he said, yes, he used to do intravenous drug use, but a year ago, and he never, and he swore, swore, swore that he had not injected himself for a year. Mm -hmm. So that's the situation right now. So is this fungal endothelmitis? But yeah. the man here telling us he did not inject for a year, uh, or actually it's not, and we're still uh, not sure what's happening. At that time, next day, late, we got the sample of the echoes and was negative for virus. So at least viral uh, retinitis is most likely uh, not the diagnosis here, which is good to know. So my, I mean, my question, which I really don't know the answer for, can you get uh, fungal endothelmitis one year after stopping injections? He may not be very reliable. Sure, yeah. I mean, I think that's, uh, and, and that's, that's what we were thinking as well. But infection disease, I mean, we're thinking if he's reliable, this is really, very unusual. I think well, it's possible because they, they get these uh, vegetations on the heart valves and the character, and it just depends on when it uh, actually, uh, you know, embolizes into the vasculature. Right. So, I mean, the, 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 the appearance of the lesion really led us to go this way. So, uh, we did Vitrostep with intravitreal voriconazole. Uh, we um, um, we uh, sent vitreous uh, sample, but that can be, came back negative. And he had also like um, uh, cardiac uh, echoes, did not show any vegetations on the heart. We, we started systemic voriconazole. Uh, this is the appearance a few days after. So lesions are more um, uh, obvious here with the vitritis settling down a bit. Yeah. When you get this uh, here, solitary not this sort of is this free floating in the vitreous? No, nope, they mm -hmm. are they are on the nerve and on the retina, so it's really going from the choroid inwards. And mm -hmm. that's that's really how we thought we made the diagnosis because you don't have many lesions budding inside the eye. So uh, that's where we thought, okay, well, this is a presumed so far it's yeah. a presumed fungal I mean, uh, infection related to IVDU, which he says, and he really swore by the fact it's only one year ago. No tattoo? Did you uh, no, no tattoo. No, that's, uh, that's uh, actually a great uh, point as well. So here, this was his follow-up about a month after, or maybe more than a month. So still vitreous is mucky. He's 2,400 to counting fingers. And that's the appearance now. So, I think gone very well to vitrix me because all this vitrix can be taken out. And, you yeah, know, I would. Go I mean, for for vi yeah, for viral, I, I, I couldn't I mean, hear Doctor Gupta. For fungal, right. for fungal, it was it's always vitrectomy, isn't it? So uh, we'll we'll come. To, I mean, uh, I I different views re and different outcomes of vitrectomy. We can touch on that if you'd like. So at that point, because of 
non-clearing vitreous it also depends capacities. On the, on the fungus, you know, whether you're looking at candida, which tends to go more in the vitreous, it depends on, uh, uh, on what type of uh, fungus it is. Sure, yeah. So again, at that point, it's all presumed, but he's getting better. So we decided to clear things really from the vitreous and uh, get also a vitreous biopsy, but mainly to clear things. So far, the diagnosis presumed fungal endothelitis. This is here, the uh, B scan. We didn't have a retinal detachment. Uh, and that's uh, the video is here of the surgery. So this is the Pusisanike, a bit of cataract there. So clearing up the posterior sinecki. And then this is the appearance inside the eye. So here I'm doing a, a vitreous biopsy under air, which is really a good technique. You can get a very big sample of the vitreous. And then because of the view was not very good, I decided to remove the lens. I'm sorry, it's playing up. And then is a 40 year old patient or slightly less, so very soft cataract. So just uh, brought it in the antechamber and single hand faker technique. Now going back to the retina, we have a better view now. And yeah, posterior vitreous separation. And now this is the lesion on the front of, on the disc and you can see it here really very obvious how it's uh, going inside the eye. So his membranes around on the retina. And that's the lesion here. Is it attached, Dr. Ahmed? Uh, it's attached uh, to the nerve ad and adher adherent and attached to the nerve and the surrounding retina. So in my view, it's fine to peel things off the nerve, but when you come to the retina, it's like diabetic membranes. Peeling becomes a bit tricky because really of how attached it is like here. So um, I was about to take it out. So I decided to open the capsule to take it out. Uh, so coming back to here, this is bimanual dissection of the remaining bit. And then I left it and I went and I did a posterior capsurexus after making the initial nick that you saw. So, Ahmed, did you do a, a, a vitreous tab for that? Yeah, I did a vitreous biopsy under air initially to get a huge, and this is the posterior capsurexus, to get a huge vitreous sample. No, I mean before that, did you go for yeah, that? Uh, yes, and it was negative, yes. It was negative. Yeah. So here, this is the lesion inside the anti-chamber. And then out of the eye. Uh, while you are, we are seeing this interesting video. There is one uh, question: Do you, can you explain, Doctor Ahmed, uh, how do you do the vitreous biopsy under the air? Uh, yes, I. So, can I, if I have a minute, I can actually show you a quick video for that. I'll, okay. Um, so here, and then this is actually the staining with hematoxin that you've seen showing inflammatory lesion with necrosis. Uh, and I think this is the important slide really where it shows with GMC stain, the purple lesions are candida. 
so he actually, so now it's a definite diagnosis. All the vitreous biopsy were negative, just the uh, tissue diagnosis was positive. And this patient did so well, really, he was um, uh, coming up to nearly 20, 25 with a contact lens. He declined to have a lens, although he could have came later on and put a lens in the bag. And that was the appearance initially. And he did so well. Uh, so it's one differential uh, diagnosis, Dr. Ahmad Arso, toxocariasis. Is, is is uh, uh, yes, I think so. But I mean, usually you get them more in children. But it's, uh, again, it's a good differential diagnosis of granuloma. TB granuloma as well are good differential diagnosis. Um, uh, another comment, it could be a cystic uh, sarcosis. Yeah, uh, but usually they are more clear and you can see the scolex. Um, again, that's another differential diagnosis. I mean, in this case, we had tissue biopsy that showed, um, uh, that showed the, uh, the candida lesions. If you have more questions, I'll very quickly get the video yeah. up of... Uh, you can, you can uh, ch check for the video while we are asking you this question also. Please. Uh, did you check, please, the limbs for active needle entry sites? This one of the from what? From the taps or from... No, if there is any needles, if he is taking drugs or something. In the lens yeah. or his skin? Uh, no, limbs. Ah, limbs, yes. Yes, he showed us. So when we were saying he, he showed us, and they all looked old, really. I mean, we didn't, like, we could not really ask him, for example, to show us his, like, femoral area, which some of them inject there. So maybe he showed us his uh, limbs, like his arm, for these, and he did not show us the femoral area. But he was in checked by infection disease, and they were actually very... Till the very end, they were doubting the diagnosis because they said they couldn't find anything, blood cultures, uh, echoes, and they probably examined his femoral area as well. They couldn't see any active area. So it really remains unclear whether he was not telling us the truth or it really was one year ago. Okay. I think uh, one important clinical point is when you are seeing very severe uveitis, look if there is a yellow glow or not. If there is a yellow glow, it is likely to be endophthalmitis because howsoever severe the uveitis might be, it does not produce a yellow glow. Right. Just a clinical point. Okay, I got the video ready. I'll... Uh, okay, the, yeah, please. Can I'll, you I'll just uh, share that. It's on another screen. Um, is there any a feel of risk of doing cataract surgery uh, with a patient of uh, undiagnosed uveitis? Uh, sorry, I, 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 I'm sorry, can we repeat the question? Do you feel, that you, feel uh, you didn't feel a risk of for doing cataract surgery with uh, undiagnosed uveitis? Uh, but I have to see to complete the surgery. So I think a risk if you're doing an elective surgery and you're putting a lens, but you have to see now to complete the surgery. For example, like you have a diabetic patient or a patient with retinal detachment and you have to see. Now I have to see to complete the surgery. Okay. Can, we, uh, can we see the video fast? Yes. yes, yes. So. Uh, Dr. Abinash, can you just start prepare for the, after Dr. Ahmed? Right. Can you see the video here? Yeah, now we can see. Can Can you see the video, doctor? Yes, yes, we are seeing the video. Yeah. Okay. All yeah. right. Okay. Let me just start it. So this is how we do it. So we uh, after priming because you have to prime the machine. We set everything on air. So you go on the infusion cannula on air and see what happens here. So you go up to really 50 or sometimes even more. But if you look at the infusion cannula here, when you have air, there's lots of fluid that you need to get out of the system. So that's how you get the infusion on air. Actually, as well, we flush the cutter with air. And that's how you do it. You undo here and you can see that you can hear the air sound. And then you connect the cutter to air. And you'll see here, 
that you're getting fluid out from the cutter. Now you're ready to go. You uh, connect back, and this is your first syringe. You put them here. So now your suction is manual while the cutting is made by the retractor. You see now. Here we're in the eye, and you can see the cutting is happening here while suction is happening through the syringes. And then we usually will do three samples. So we send bacteria and fungal, uh, viral and toxo PCR and lymphoma in a case where we're not sure. And then here, this is the view inside the eye. So you're cutting as air comes in. And I'll show you how the view looks from outside here in this picture in picture. So you can see you're working deep and the eye is filling with air above. And then you can get a huge sample without risking the eye collapse and without diluting the vitreous. So you're really working under the air. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ahmad. It was very interesting. Case. And then you shift to fluid and you finish off. Yes. Uh, yes. So I think we answer most of the questions. So we can now have Dr. Avinash, uh, Dr. Abi. Yeah. Yeah. Please, can you start sharing? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, please. Great. So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Muhammad, and uh, for this lovely platform and to Alamera. It's great to be uh, on this uh, symposium uh, with, uh, with Vishali, who's a good friend, and with Ahmed, who we trained together in uh, Mofield many, many, many years ago. Uh, so I am, um, you know, fantastic cases by everyone. Um, you know, all these mysteries and exotic things. So I'm, I'm you know, be, uh, going to be a bit more straightforward. My cases are fairly simple. Uh, but I just wanted to share my experience of using Iluvian with, uh, uh, in, in cases of uh, non-infectious uveitis. So I've got three quick, small cases. And, uh, and you know, I'd like to see what everybody else's uh, experience has been with Iluvian and how it can be a useful tool. So, you know, Iluvian uh, is the flucinolone implant, uh, 0 0.19 milligrams, a sustained release over three years, not biodegradable. Uh, it offers some relief from repeated uh, injection of shorter acting steroids, which we've been doing for uh, much longer, uh, whether that's transinolone or Ozdex, both uh, which I use extensively. And it also ha may help with the long-term control of uveitis. There are some assumptions or some mis you know, or some, uh, some things that you know, we all think about. Iluvian, because it's a slow release, uh, a low dose drug eluding, it does take a long time to work. Uh, and so you know, people are worried that it may not work uh, in, in, in quickly enough. Uh, a lot of people do say that it does not work for severe cases. Um, and, you know, one, one uh, assumption that I've, I've heard in many of these sort of webinars recently was that it works in only cases, you know, where these steroid implants last for a long time. Uh, and so that's assuming that there's a low inflammatory drive rather than a high inflammatory drive. So I, I just thought I'd share a couple, few of my recent cases and see what you uh, what you think about it. So this uh, first case is a 34 year old lady who presented to me in 2015 with, and she said, oh, I have a history of uveitis and she was treated with steroids only for several years. And she uh, had cataract surgery elsewhere. And she had very poor vision, 660 in the right eye and 624 in the left eye. She was on about 40 milligrams of uh, prednisolone on monotherapy for the last two years. And you can see that, you know, she's got this very extensive amount of uh, multifocal lesions. And she had a uh, sort of tan uveitis picture. Uh, she, so I could say that, you know, she was undertreated. Uh, she had a lot of systemic complications, Cushingoids, she had secondary diabetes. Remember, this is a young lady. 
And, uh, uh, you know, the differential here, of course, would be VKH, especially in this uh, region in the Middle East. But uh, for somebody who was undertreated for several years, she didn't have any of the other uh, systemic manifestations except for the sunset glow type fundus. And so, uh, you know, she was, we were treating her as a MSCPU. Uh, so I started her on uh, systemic immunosuppression with the mycophenolate uh, uh, mofetil, and you know, and she and she responded very well. So this was after about three months. You can see the uh, horror picture much better, and this had cleared, and, and you know, she was doing much better. She was now six eighteen in the right eye, six six in the left eye, and she was thrilled. So the patient was very happy. Uh, I was very happy. And uh, you know, uh, this was this was great. Uh, of course, uh, the next thing she says uh, that you know, now that my eyes are sorted, I want to have a baby, and I want to stop my systemic medication. And you know, I was uh, you know uh, thinking, oh, hold on, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, for eight years you've been you know for years you've been uh, undertreated. We finally got you to a place where it's comfortable, and now you want to stop your treatment and she was adamant so she said look i'm going to stop treatment you you know do what you want you have to manage so uh, i had to wean her off the mycophenolate wait for six months before she can try to conceive and we went to plan b which was repeated ozidex injection so this was her about uh, uh pre ozidex uh, this was in uh, you know 2016 in in march and then she had her she had the Ozidex, and then in the right eye, she, you know, had four Ozidex injections in the in the next sort of uh, year and a bit, and she had uh, fortunately um, managed to get pregnant, uh, IVF, and had her baby. Uh, and uh, this is the left eye. This was her better eye, which was. Uh, you know, this was, uh, and every time the Ozidex would wear off, we would give her another Ozidex, and, you know, she had four or five, and this went on. So, you know, she was treated successfully with systemic treatment, and then, but then it went on that the Ozidex would last for only two months. And so I advised her to, uh, that, you know, we should perhaps try Iluvian, uh, and this was uh, at the time not uh, covered by the insurance in Dubai, but in Abu Dhabi it was covered. So my dear friend uh, Igor Kozak, who's at uh, Morefield in Abu Dhabi, very kindly agreed to uh, treat her with the alluvian. And, uh, you know, so the next uh, few images are courtesy of uh, Dr. Igor, who I know, um, uh, who, who very kindly shared these with me. So this was her eye. So she's off all treatment. Uh, this is in uh, September 2018, uh, and this is pre-Iluvian. And so she had the Iluvian uh, a little while after that, and this is her six months later, and this is only on Iluvian. And from what I understand, even uh, until now, she's not needed any further treatment. This is the right eye. This is the left eye pre-Iluvian, uh, and her vision is maintained. She's not required any other treatment. This is the right eye. You can see all the witches' haze. That's cleared and uh, similar in the left eye. So this, you know, you can see very severe case of uh, multifocal choroiditis and fan uveitis, you know, treated successfully with uh, mycophenolate, but wanted local therapy. Needed two monthly Ozudex for, uh, you know, three years or so. And so she had several injections. Uh, and then in uh, December 2018, was given a bilateral Iluvian one after the other, and has now been flare-free for more than a year. So this sort of uh, illustrates the long-term control of inflammation in these patients of uh, non-infectious uh, uveitis. So um, any comments at this stage? Uh, Dr. Vichali, do you have any experience with uh, using Iluvian in the treatment of uh, yes, uveitis? Of we have used a lot with diabetic macular edema. It works. I mean, and it's a long-term solution. I would be very happy to use it for uveitis the day it comes in India. I do a lot of local. Like, we use about 200 Ozodex implant a year, so I would be very happy using this. 
Uh, Dr. Ahmad, I think you, you have more experience because in United States, I think it's available a long time. Yes, um, yeah, so it's uh, available uh, in the United States, it's available under Illuven for diabetic macular edema, under, under UTIC, uh, a name UTIC for uveitis. It's just a different injector, very similar molecule. Um, I think it's a very good medication. I still do reticers for severe cases. So I, uh, I suit your reticers as well. Um, um, I mean, they, they get FDA approved for uveitis uh, since when? Uh, since I think was a, it's available now for nearly nine months. Okay. So in, in the US, I think it's different. Do you have so a chance? In, in the, parent, the, the, the parent company has sold the uh, rights of uh, uveitis to another country for, and it's marketed as UTIC. Yes. Uh, whereas here for uveitis, uh, the rest of the world, uh, uh, you know, Alamera Sciences distributes it for diabetes and for uveitis under the uh, name of, uh, of Illuvian. And uh, it has been licensed in Europe and in, uh, in our region uh, for uveitis as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just show you another case. Now, this, uh, this guy, uh, 30-year-old chap from Pakistan presents with, you know, he came to me with reduced vision and floater. This is, again, two or three years ago. And you can see he's got this typical, you know, somebody who's talking about eels-like disease, but it's this uh, vasculite. He's got this periflebitis, occlusive vasculitis. Um, uh, and, and quite sort of dramatic picture. And... Uh, uh, the uh, you know so uh, his quantiferon gold was positive you know being from the uh, subcontinent uh, widespread vasculitis periphrobitis so then he was treated with anti tb uh, treatment and steroids and then I put him on uh, mycophenolate uh, and lasered all the um, areas of non perfusion but uh, you can see that his uh, you know he had these sort of vein occlusion type pictures also with a lot of uh, macular edema and uh, in, in, in uh, the right eye. And if you see the, uh, the right eye here, uh, this was, uh, you know, about, uh, so this was uh, in, in July of 2018. Uh, and then, you know, he kept recurring. He, he kept re getting this macular edema. I had given him some anti-VEGF at the beginning because of the occlusive disease, but uh, his macular edema kept on uh, coming back. And, uh, you know, he kept having Ozidex injections, and he responded very well to the Ozidex injections. So this is him three months after that. Uh, his uh, insurance, and you know, so this was him at the time. You know, he'd been lasered to the hilt, and uh, but he just kept on getting the uh, macular edema. So uh, at this point, he sort of moved across to another facility because his uh, insurance was, was no longer covered with us, and he con he had another eight Ozidex injections over the next two years at another facility. Uh, then he came back to me uh, in February this year, uh, and again uh, with this macular edema, and he noticed he had fallen. He had had uh, an Ozidex injection about three months prior to that uh, at the other facility, and so I said, okay, you know, we've had so many, let's try uh, with Iluvian, and so I gave him an Iluvian. And uh, and this is him, you know, literally a month later. So uh, I, had, I had prepped him at the time saying, look, Iluvian will take a long time. Maybe we'll have to add some, give you an Ozidex top up or this or that. But uh, literally a month later, he was much better. And this, I saw him just last week and, you know, he, his macula still remains dry. So, uh, you know, that was pleasing to see. Uh, that uh, this sort of patient who's had to have several Ozidex again, uh, Iluvian can work pretty quickly. So this was another point that, you know, people always argue that, oh, Iluvian takes a long time. And I was quite surprised in this case that it worked pretty quickly for his uh, uveitic macular edema. 
Now, uh, I don't know if uh, the if you agree with the treatment or the management there, especially with these sort of uh, TB type patients. Yeah, I would agree. It's done. It's worked well for your patient. And uh, you know, he's uh, he had stopped his mycophenolate uh, because again, his insurance company was not covering. And maybe if he had stayed on systemic treatment, he may not have recurred as often. But uh, uh, again, you know, if the Iluvian keeps him under control and he doesn't get any uh, fresh inflammation, then uh, that might uh, spare him from uh, long-term systemic immunosuppression. I do. Do you do you, do you get to see some of these patients, uh, Ahmed, in uh, in Arkansas? I know there's Which a lot patients? of uh, Which patients? Uh, which patients, Abby? TB delayed hypersensitivity uveitis, or yeah, yeah, yeah. We see lots of infection. We did, I didn't actually have a case of TB delayed hypersensitivity uveitis since I left England, but uh, we saw uh, TB serpiginous uveitis. Uh, we saw lots of we have syphilitic patients who we treat as well with Ozodex after anti-syphilis treatment. I didn't treat any one of them with Eluvin, but Eluvin can be as well. So I have a couple of patients with persistent macular edema where they get Ozodex now with Eluvin there, we can consider that as well. I don't, see, I don't see any problem treating infections as long as the infection treatment has been given. Uh, yeah, I agree. Well, you know, if we've treated their uh, TB and they've been lasered in the non-perfused area and they, you know, their ischemic drive is, come, is presumably switched off, why do they keep getting this uh, macular edema, which is so steroid responsive? I think it's like the syphilitic patients as well. They get, they keep getting macular edema in the absence of a, a recurrences or reactivation. It just their immune system gets, I think, affected by the infection, and they just continue to get. Uh, and also, the, there might be the it's it's also the blood uh, retinal barrier has an insult, so there's no like active inflammatory drive, but it's just the blood the retinal barrier is weak. Uh, do you have any comment, Dr. Vichari, about this? I think when we are talking about infections, uh, it's very important, not for you guys, but for the other people to be very careful. There is no active infection, number one. And second, in TB in particular, there are two types of TB. One is multiple, like what Hassan was showing. You have those huge granuloma, subretinal injections. Uh, subretinal abscess, don't give local injection in those circumstances. But if you have the vasculitis, the immune mediated response where you are not expecting any bacteria to be multiplying in the eye and you have given treatment for infection, there it can be used very nicely instead of uh, systemic treatment. But still, you have to keep covering with the uh, uh, anti tuberculosis at that time, right? Okay. Yeah, you, you treat them for the TB, yeah. So it's not yeah. the first. I mean, you have to give the TB treatment, and and you know, mm -hmm. again, uh, what I don't like is where some people give the TB prophylaxis, uh, and uh, you know, these patients need full TB treatment. Yeah. That increases the chances of drug resistance. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So again, uh, you know, just a quick uh, case number three. This uh, this. this uh, is another this lady came to me this 36 year old uh, school teacher she again was treated elsewhere for UBI this very you know upsetting case so she came with her right eye she was nearly blind with this huge detachment and a lot of scar tissue here and really this eye could not be salvaged in the other eye she had a uh, pale disc and you know a lot of uh, inflammation she, had, she was pseudo -phakic. And again, never been immunosuppressed, which was a huge surprise to me. Uh, she was being treated, uh, uh, you know, and for several years, but never, never been Im immunosuppressed. Uh, and so this was in 2016. So I started her on mycophenolate and gave her an Ozidex, and, and you know, her vision improved to six nine in that eye, in the left eye, and you know, she couldn't believe it, and. Uh, I, you know, it was 
uh, gratifying that she could improve, but really upsetting that you know uh, she hadn't been immunosuppressed for so long. And so this was her left eye pre-treatment and and then post-treatment. Uh, but again, you know, she kept getting this uh, a bit of macular edema, and her vision would fluctuate. I know there's this big epiretinal membrane, but seeing that uh, you know she had uh, this was her only eye, and it was uh, quite a delicate situation. Her vision was not too bad; she was managing. Uh, but every time this sort of happened, her vision went from sort of six twelve, six nine to six twelve to six eighteen. And as a school teacher, she found it very difficult. So again, she kept having uh, Ozidex uh, injections, and uh, uh, and this was in in September. And then uh, she came back in December again um, uh, with the six twelve vision and a few er more areas of uh, cystic uh, cystoid chain. And so I said, okay, uh, why don't we try alluvian? Uh, so I gave that to her in December and then in January she improved. And then again, I saw her in February, she's back to six, nine and she's due to, she was due to see me um, uh, this week, but I think she postponed it due to the whole uh, home learning situation that she as a school teacher has been overwhelmed with uh, organizing online learning for her students. Uh, so again, you know, uh, very useful in this sort of situation and helps her. She's still on her uh, mycophenolate, but it just means that, you know, she doesn't have to have that repeated injection. And of course, you, every time they flare, you flare up and you get fresh macular, it's possible that, you know, you're gonna end up with some collateral damage and that you keep things uh, to control means that that would be so it's a good response to Iluvian here early on with a, a pretty good visual result so you know uh, Iluvian can be pretty effective for the control of uh, uveitis and uveitic macular edema uh, you know it can work quickly sometimes it doesn't so it's important to say to your patients that you know this can take up to three months they're used to having Ozidex which works instantly uh, you know, Ozidex, you give it literally within a few days, patients do notice the improvement. Alluvian can take a bit longer, but sometimes you'll be surprised that it will work quicker. It can last for a long time. I do say to the patients that you may require top-up treatment with another Ozidex or an anti-VEGF, depends, along the course. But overall number of injections over the, the three-year period should be less. May also be effective as monotherapy, not as an initial treatment, but once you've got control and the disease is subsided, you can uh, consider as monotherapy, as we saw with the first patient who stopped her systemic medication. Uh, it can be used as an adjunct to the systemic treatment, as we saw with the, the previous case, uh, and, and reduces the need for these repeated injections and reduces the flare-ups as well. So. Another useful tool in our uh, armamentarium, I think. Uh, so that that's all I have to say. Uh, just my experience. Thank you, with, thank uh, you, Ilubian thanks, Abby, for the this. Of years. Thank you, Abby, for the very interesting cases and showing how Illuvian work in uveitis in different situation. Uh, we have uh, only one question: Does Illuvian has more impact on IOP than Ozordex? It's for you. Uh, uh, I mean, um, the short answer is probably yes, and you would, but in, in when you look at the studies, alluvian compared to reticert has a much, much reduced IOP uh, raising profile, and, and again, it, it tends to be temporary, so patients, you will monitor them. These are patients with uveitis, especially they will be the ones who have uh, pressure problems either up or low or high and uh, you are going to monitor them and they do respond to uh, topical treatment reasonably well. The ones, uh, the diabetic patients, you know, when you look at them, uh, does their pressure go up uh, significantly? I don't think so uh, compared to Ozidex. It's, it's pretty much similar. Okay. Um, any experience with interferon for tubercular macular edema? This is... Uh for all the panels, if anyone wants to answer. No, I don't have any experience. 
Jiptor and Shub. Yeah, Vishali, I think you have some. I tried for paradoxical worsening. I tried in four patients. It worked for one patient, not for two. So I'm not too much. Not too much. Okay. No. We... Uh, there is a uh, question. Please comment on anti VGF, uh, anti sorry, anti VEGF versus steroid injection for uveitic uh, persistent macular edema. Um, so personally, I don't uh, use anti VEGF for uveitic macular edema. Yes. Uh, there was a trial done uh, or study done. Uh, I think it was called the LIMO study. It was lucentis in macular edema, which which got stopped because it doesn't really work. I think these are it doesn't work. So I don't use anti VEGF. Anti VEGF is useful for many cases of uveitis where they have new neovascularization, things like thick and for secondary CNVs, extremely useful. But for macular edema, which which is an inflammatory driven process, no, I don't. I think it's also I mean, that anti VEGF works on a very uh, specific part of the um, inflammation cascade, really, if it works on anything. And just on the VEGF, well, steroids have more than multiple mechanisms, and it's just not enough. I use anti VEGF if IOP is high and you don't want to give steroid injection. But currently, we are doing this merit trial by Doug Jabs and all, where we are comparing the methotrexate, uh, ozodex, and uh, this one, anti -vegif. So let's see what that multicenter results show. But I agree, most of the time, it's the steroid which works very well. But if the IOP is high, then we tend to give anti -vegif. But, uh, you know, Dr. Avichari, we are dealing with the uh, inflammation uh, in case of uveitis. So um, maybe you are treating the edema in a certain limit, but uh, in the general, do you think steroid is more better? Yes. So there is one question also. Any advantage for cell sept over methotrexate in the last case presented? Uh, Avi, the yeah, I mean, uh, conventionally, you know, there was a study done by Nisha Acharya recently, and uh, with uh, in conjunction with uh, a, a, with uh, with uh, Doctor uh, Ratinam, uh, Ratinam in, in in Arvind, and uh, you know that uh, I think most UVI specialists were a little surprised with the result and. Uh, we found that methotrexate in my, uh, actually did better than mycophenolate in in controlling uveitis. Which, when the uveitis specialists were surveyed, they felt that mycophenolate should, may be better. Which drug to use in which disease? I think most people will have a personal feel. I find that in you know uh, things like anterior uveitis, scleritis, methotrexate works much better. In posterior uveitis, uh, I find uh, mycophenolate that works better. But again, that is my anecdotal evidence. The the the, the trial done by uh, Dr. Ratinam and, and uh, Nisha showed that uh, methotrexate and mycophenolate are, are pretty similar. Thank you, thank you, thanks, Avi. Okay, Dr. Vichari, can you prepare uh, the question or raise hand? There is raise hand from Dr. Muhammad Shahid. Okay, Dr. Vichari, go ahead till here. He is ready. Uh, mycophenolate needs less of monitoring than methotrexate. It's easier to handle. But I think there is something to do with pharmacogenetics. It doesn't work in Indian population. So maybe that is why the results of that study were kind of, you know, a surprise. Sure. Because when I worked in Vyad, it used to work very well. When I came to India, it just doesn't work. So I don't know why. Dr. Amri, can I, uh, can I uh, put a quick comment on the question, uh, yes. does local treatment works uh, compared to systemic treatment? Okay. I think it, good to look at the MUST trial, which looked at uh, 
uh, reticert versus systemic treatment for non-infectious uveitis. If you look at the three years data, which is really interesting where the reticert was working and that can be extrapolated on other local treatment, the results were the same for uveitis control and for vision. But then if you come and look at the um, extension of the study, the retrospective extension at seven years, patients on systemic treatment did better. The reason is there was more adherence to treatment on, in the systemic group and patients who had reticert, a big number of them did not have another reticert. So I think it's really both work so well. We know that local treatment works better for macular edema, but it's all about systemic side effects versus local side effects and the adherence. So that's really an important point to keep in mind. In practice, I use a combination of both. Yeah. You would use yeah. systemic treatment because there are so many extraocular manifestations of uveitis, which will not be taken care of by local therapy. But sometimes <laughs> a very high dose of systemic therapy to manage the acute exacerbations in between. Those can be handled by supplementing the local therapy. <laughs> Low dose are the, you know, the just adequate dose of systemic immunosuppression in the back. <laughs> okay, can we have Dr. Muhammad Shahid? Dr. Muhammad, if you are there, can you please? Dr. Muhammad. Uh, John, Dr. Muhammad with us? Yes, no. Okay, Dr. Mohammed, if you hear us, can you go ahead and ask or, or do your comment, please? Dr. Mohammed Shahid. Hello? I don't know, we lost him. Uh, we, I just, uh, I would like to thank you all. If there is any uh, last uh, comment or uh, talk from any of the panelists, uh, Dr. Vichari, thank you very much for being with us. I know it's very late for you. Now I know, I think it's one o'clock. We are sorry for that, but we know there is a different. Ahmed is still very happy because it's only in the day, is in the yes. clinic. Me and Abby, we are almost also at 12 o'clock or near to the 12 o'clock. So I'd like to thank you and congratulations for the new book that you already, this year you have uh, issued. And we need uh, to, if you want to announce about the name, so everyone it can ask it or have it in which way they can get it. Mm -hmm. nice. Uveitis text and it's a uveitis settlers. Um, it's co authored by me, Dr. Fouk Lohan from Paris and Dr. Kwan from Stanford. So I'll be happy to share a link uh, which Dr. Mohammed and we can send it to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Richard. Thanks a lot. Uh, Dr. Mohammed, you are there. Can you please go ahead? Dr. Mohammed. Hello? There's some disturbance. Yeah. Uh, there is any uh, question. There is one question. This for all panelists. I think the last question. How do you manage acute VKH and posterior scleritis with exudative retinal detachment in the era of COVID? Any in comments? COVID. Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, we have given the guidelines like I can share it with you and you can circulate by IUSG, IOIS and FOIS together, all these societies, we have prepared the guidelines. Prefer local therapy over systemic whenever you can. There is no contraindication to using steroids, oral, but avoid intravenous methylprednisolone if the patient is COVID suspect. If the patient is COVID positive, then prefer local therapy and don't give steroids at all. Regarding the immunosuppression, it can be started both in COVID positive and in COVID uh, suspects. And if at all you have to give biologics, prefer tocilizumab, but all these have to be given in consultation with your infectious disease expert. So uh, we have other... guidelines evolving consensus, like I can email it to you, which you can yes. submit to all the people. That would be very nice. 
Uh, Dr. Ahmed, you have any comment about this one, or it is the same? Uh, no, I would I would do the same as well. I was I would uh, I mean I think very important for ophthalmologists is to stay safe. So patients really with suspected COVID, I would even not see them unless they have a a size threatening or painful condition because your safety first. Second, I would uh, yeah depend more on local treatment. Um, and it's great if Dr. Gupta can share with, uh, with us the guidelines. Yes. Uh, Abi? Uh, yeah, no, I, I agree with the same. And, you know, uh, the guidelines that uh, I received from the societies that uh, Vishali uh, is talking about is, is largely what I'm following. So I will, I will try to get uh, it from you. Know, Vishali. What we don't want is what we don't want is patients to go blind. Uh, and patients with, you know, VKH or posterior steroid pain, you know, they do need treatment and uh, you know, oral steroids can be used and, uh, you know, if uh, an immunosuppression, and, and this is what we're saying to the patients that, you know, you continue with your immunosuppression, you can take your immunosuppression. If you do develop uh, COVID, then, you know, that uh, is a different ball game and then that we can get in contact with the uh, infectious disease specialist who's looking after them. And in some cases, they it can be, you know, they may continue with it. Some cases they may have to stop. Certainly IL-6 inhibition with the tocilizumab is the, you know, is, is sometimes used for the treatment of these immune reactions in, uh, in, in COVID. So it can be used in uh, off-label in uh, uveitis as well. There is very nice data coming from rheumatology where they are not starting yeah. immunization. I have just shared the document with you on WhatsApp. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks a lot again, Dr. Bichari. Dr. Ahmed, it was uh, an honor to be with us. Uh, we miss you for a long time. We have you before two years, I think. So we hope to see you next year or another webinar. No. Dr. Abi, thanks a lot. Dr. Hassan, thanks for Alimera for uh, supporting uh, this uh, uh, meeting and this webinar. Thanks for all the speaker for their attendees. And before we are going to, to uh, close our sessions, we'd like just to inform there is a, um, a survey. It will be sent uh, to everyone. So please, before you close the webinar, just uh, uh, answer all this survey. Uh, do you want to stay or they can just send it back to us, John? Thank you. Good night, okay. everyone. Thank you and good night, Dr. Thank Bichali. you very much, Vishali. Good morning, good Dr. Ahmed. Good night. Good night. Bye, Abby. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Bye, Thank bye. you. Thank you, Visha. Thank, Thank you, you Dr. Abinash. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Abinash. Thanks a lot. Okay. By the way, we can conclude our session. Thank you for all of you. Thanks for our attendees. And see you, inshallah, next week with a very interesting session about the anterior segment. It will be about secondary IOL how to deal and the different procedure we are going to show how you can do it and what is the complication and other things advantage at this advantage. Thanks for all of you and good night. Thank you very much. Goodbye, Dr. Rahman, Dr. Abi, goodbye. Goodbye. Good night, good night. Good night. Sorry, we're trying to...